With the utmost respect, humility, and with the recognition that we are always learning, we would like to acknowledge that the University of Calgary is located on Treaty 7 territory. We are grateful to be on the traditional territory, territory of the Blackfoot, which includes the Siksika, the Bikani, and the Kaina First Nations. Treaty 7 is also home to the Satina, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, the Wesley, and the Bear Spa First Nations, as well as the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We want to honor and respect those these nations, their living history, and the land that they have cared for since time immemorial. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Daryl. Great, thanks Amelia. Um, with us today, we've got four uh, excellent and accomplished panelists. Um, we have uh, Gary Perkins. He uh, currently works with the Alberta Utilities Commission uh, he's earned a Master of Laws uh, in Natural Resources, Energy, and Environmental Law from the U of C in 2019. Um, <clears throat> also with us, some of you may recognize Professor Hamilton. Uh, he, uh, he earned a JD from New Brunswick and an LLM from Osgoode Hall, and he currently teaches probably some of the folks on this call property law, or did last year as well. Um, and he also teaches an upper year course in um, Aboriginal Peoples in the Law. He's, uh, he's written and co-authored numerous uh, papers and a blog posts uh, covering topics like Indigenous peoples and federalism and foundations of the duty to consult. Um, also joining us, we have uh, Megan Conroy. Uh, she's a partner with the Edmonton office of MLT Aikens. Uh, she, uh, as her bio describes on the site, she advises First Nations and Métis communities on constitutional issues, including consultation activities. Uh, and she also represented five uh, intervener First Nations at the Supreme Court of Canada in the Grassy Narrows case. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Bill Snow. He's a member of the Stony Nakoda First Nation and Wesley First Nation. Uh, and he works as the consultation manager for the Stony Nakoda Nation uh, since 2012. So um, I'll let him speak a little bit more to what, uh, what that involves. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just a quick little bit of housekeeping. If there are questions that come up along the way, uh, feel free to uh, put them in the chat or send them directly to Amelia or to uh, Jeff. Um, and then we can we can address them as we go or um, uh, or or we'll have time at the end of the at the end of the talk to have some actual audience questions, hopefully. Um, and before we get things rolling here, uh, we'll just turn it over to Mark for a moment to, to say a few words for the Running Meat Society. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'll be very quick. I know we want to get to the substance of the panel. Uh, my name is Mark Vancini. I'm the National Director of the Running Meat Society. I just want to say a very quick word of thanks on behalf of all of us at the Society to uh, Daryl and to Lisa and to Jeff uh, for all their work in putting this event together. And I also want to sincerely thank the Indigenous Law Club and Amelia and Ava and Aaron for uh, co-hosting this event with us. Uh, this is such an important topic and it's right at the core of uh, what running means concerned with the rule of law and constitutionalism in Canada. And uh, we're just so happy to be partnered with the Indigenous Law Club uh, on this event. So thank you all. Uh, thank you for your work. And uh, let's, uh, this is going to be a great event. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> so the, the plan for the agenda was to start off with uh, some, some introductory comments from each of the speakers. We were going to start with Mr. Perkins uh, to give a bit of a background about some of the seminal cases and what he, what he does with the AUC. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, and, and I wanna thank the Runnymede Society and the Indigenous Law Club for inviting me to uh, participate in the discussion today. Um, who am I? I'm, I'm legal counsel to the Alberta Utilities Commission. Um, the commission is the independent government appointed agency that regulates the utility sector in Alberta primarily the uh, electricity and natural gas utilities. Uh, the commission makes two basic kinds of decisions. Um, it set, sets rates for the service that is furnished by privately owned service providers. And it also approves the construction and operation of uh, utility facility infrastructure. Um, I work on the facility side of things. I do not do rates work. Um, I have a standing uh, sort of joke with uh, Professor Nigel Banks that everything I know about rates I learned in his energy law class. He thinks it's a joke, but it's true. Um, so I do not do rates. Please no rates questions. Um, 
I've been legal counsel to, also been legal counsel to the oil and gas regulator in Alberta, uh, the most recent version of that being the Alberta Energy Regulator. And it was the work I was doing there in oil sands projects starting about 17 years ago that uh, introduced me to the uh, world of Section 35 rights and Crown consultation. So um, that's uh, probably all you need to know about me. Uh, just let me give the standard disclaimer that so that nobody hears this lead. Um, although I work for the commission, I am not a member of the commission. I am not a decision maker here. And so uh, nothing I say today should be taken as being or reflecting the views of the commission. And um, if you decide to cite me as your authority, uh, you do so at great peril to whatever argument you're making at the time. Um, so again, just thanks again to the society and the club for inviting me here today. Perfect. Thanks, Gary. Um, uh, next, I think we we're going to turn it over to Professor Hamilton um, to just give sort of a, an overview of the state of the law and, and what um, maybe a sort of a primer for people who haven't taken your, your first year uh, property class yet. Okay. Thanks, Daryl. So, um, yeah, I'll try to orient here. I wasn't quite sure where we were going to, um, each of the participants are going to come in in terms of what substantive issues we're going to address, but if you'd like me to do a bit of an overview piece, we can start with that. Um, so the duty to, con what is the duty to consult and accommodate, right? We've all heard a lot about it and we see it come up in the news very frequently. Um, basically the Crown has an obligation to consult and where necessary accommodate um, Indigenous peoples wherever it considers or it has real or constructive knowledge of, of an asserted or established Aboriginal right and it considers an activity that may impact that right, right? So this is a very broad sort of umbrella when we think about it in these terms. The Crown doesn't have to have uh, real knowledge, it's real or constructive, right? Either it knows or it ought to know about the existence or the assertion of an Aboriginal or treaty right. And it's considering some sort of activity that may have an adverse impact on that. So whenever we have this situation, the Crown has a constitutional obligation to enter into uh, consultations with those with the concerned Indigenous uh, peoples. <clears throat> now, the content of that consultation, how much consultation is going to be required, is determined by what the court refers to as a spectrum. So uh, the spectrum uh, is sort of laid out in terms of the strength of the claim and the severity of the impact. So when you have a very strong claim, either an established Aboriginal or treaty right, or a claim that has a very high likelihood of success, and when you have a considerable impact, right, some sort of development um, that is of considerable scale or is going to impact the exercise of that right directly, then you're going to be at the high end of a consultation spectrum. And when you're at that end of the spectrum, um, there are certain types of duties that are required that I'll speak to in a second. When you're at the low end, right, so you may have a, a claim that's being put forward that the court considers uh, tangential, perhaps, or less likely to, to, to succeed, or you have a very minimal impact, right? You may have uh, something like a road that's being built that's at some distance from where a given First Nation is, in, is practicing their Aboriginal or treaty rights, so the impact may be more minimal in the court's view. Then you're going to be at the low end of the spectrum, and when you're down at that end, you can be as low as something like notice being given, right? Has notice been given before the project has gone forward? I think the most interesting cases are the ones where you're at the, at the higher end of the spectrum and very, much, and very frequently that ends up being where the disputes are. So uh, it's, it's less a dispute about where you are on the spectrum or whether there's a duty to consult or those, those cases do come up, but more both parties say, okay, yes, there's a duty to consult. There's an impact on a right. Now, what level of consultation is required? Has there been sufficient consultation in a given case? So fre frequently with, for example, um, this, the Slay-Wattooth decision and the Trans Mountain Pipeline, those are the types of disputes we see. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of quick words then, what constitutes meaningful consultation then um, when, we, when we're at this higher end of the spectrum? And again, I'll stick at that end. Um, <clears throat> We've the, the duty to consult doctrine has um, matured.
quite a bit, right? It was first articulated in Haida Nation in 2004. So we have quite a large body of case law now to draw on in trying to substantiate the doctrine a little bit. And the recent decision from the Federal Court of Appeal in the Coldwater decision uh, provided quite a bit of guidance and rearticulation around what constitutes meaningful um, consultation. So to start, um, it's important to to recognize that the honor, uh, the, sorry, that the duty to consult is sort of shaped by two guiding principles. So one is the honor of the crown. The honor of the crown, the court has said, um, arises because of the fact that there were indigenous peoples living in Canada, um, in organized societies, exercising uh, rights <clears throat> at the time that the crown asserted sovereignty over that territory. So the Crown's assertion of sovereignty, of sovereign control over territory that was occupied by Indigenous peoples gives rise to the honour of the Crown. It places certain types of obligations on the Crown and imposes duties on the Crown. So the honour of the Crown is one guiding principle. Now the, the obligations that the honour of the Crown gives rise to differ depending in different circumstances. The duty to consult is sort of one instantiation of what, of, uh, one thing, one set of duties that the honor of the crown can give rise to. The second guiding principle is reconciliation uh, in the court's view. So the court has, inter has articulated reconciliation in a, in a whole host of different ways. I think one thing that you want to pay close attention to in, in reading through these types of cases is to uh, remember that the political use of the term reconciliation is quite distinct from the legal use. Right, so you get a whole bunch of different legal definitions that would be given in the cases. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the first articulation is that the purpose of Section 35 is to reconcile Indigenous interests with asserted Crown sovereignty. Right, so that's, a, that's something very different from the notion of reconciliation that we might be putting forward in political contexts. Okay, so these, these uh, guiding principles then shape the court, they, they establish obligations uh, that the Crown holds in relation to Indigenous peoples. When we're at the high end of the spectrum of consultation, so the duty to consult has, has arisen, really what we're looking for there is uh, good faith engagement on the part of the Crown uh, regarding the project, its impacts, um, the Indigenous understanding of the rights at issue and how the project is likely to impact those rights. The court in the Tsleil-Waututh decision really emphasized that there's a need for what it referred to as meaningful two-way dialogue. Okay, so it's not enough for the Crown merely to send uh, note takers, right, to listen to the Indigenous parties and then say, okay, great, we know your concern, check mark, now we'll go make our decision, right? It has to engage in a meaningful process of two-way dialogue where it goes in good faith under, seeks to understand the Indigenous concerns and then seeks to uh, allow those concerns to shape the decision that it's going to make. Further, it has to present, for example, uh, written evidence, uh, very often written reasons showing that it's taken this into concern. So how has it tried to understand the Indigenous concerns? How have those shaped the decision and so forth? Now, when, when framed in that way, it can seem quite robust, but it's also important to understand the limits on it, right? So uh, again, looking at the cold water decision, the court emphasized again and again and again, what does the duty to consult not include? A so-called veto, right? So can a First Nation say no? Um, the court has been consistent, right, across its duty to consult jurisprudence in this. The duty to consult does not include the right to refuse a project or to say no. Uh, to flip that around another way, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't include a requirement to obtain consent, right? So this is the framework that we work with him. When it's at its highest end, the duty to consult requires this meaningful two-way dialogue back and forth, taking into, cons into consideration the Indigenous concerns, allowing the decisions to be shaped by those concerns, yet, uh, and even a formal participation in the decision-making process, not up to the level of actually requiring consent. Okay, so I'll just say a couple of quick words then about some areas uh, that I consider of particular interest going forward uh, for the duty to consult. So one is 
uh, how the doctrine is going to respond to cumulative impacts. So uh, this is, so for example, uh, a given First Nation may find that their rights are being impacted um, by a whole host of different developments. This is a, a big problem, for example, in Treaty 8 territory, where First Nations are saying, well, look, it's all of these developments taken together are undermining our ability to exercise our rights. The duty to consult tends to want to focus only on one project at a time, right? Well, what are the impacts of this project? Um, so the doctrine has developed in ways that can start trying to respond to that, but it's still an area of tension and an area that needs development. Uh, a second one that I think lots of us will be watching is what's the relationship between legislation and the duty to consult. So there is recent case law from the Supreme Court um, suggesting there is no duty to consult in the process of the development of legislation. Um, it was all given an obiter, um, but I think this would fall into the persuasive at obiter category because um, you know, they didn't really talk about anything else. So that was the, uh, that was the gist of the decision, but nonetheless, it was, a, it was a highly divided court and there are lots of issues around that that need to be sorted out. Um, something that we see re uh, really clearly when we look at the recent coastal gas link decision, for example, around the Northern Gateway project is who is it that's going to be consulted, right? Increasingly indigenous peoples are um, asserting rights of self-determination and asserting rights to be governed in accordance with traditional forms of governance. Is it enough to consult with elected governments or band council governments or governments that are established under, under self-government agreements or other forms of governments or uh, do or to what extent do hereditary or other forms of traditional government need to be involved in those discussions? All really important questions that we don't necessarily have clear answers to. Um, and finally, I think one very niche one that probably only interests me and Mark um, is what is the applicable uh, standard of review um, when we start talking about applying Vavilov in the context of administrative decisions under the uh, duty to consult. So that's a fun, um, very niche, nerdy piece. Um, okay, so, and then sort of the, the big picture one is increasingly we've seen a push toward free prior and informed consent as if not uh, law as a very persuasive uh, norm sort of in, in Canada and indigenous peoples have increasingly been voicing their understanding that their constitutional relationship with the Crown requires their consent where the rights are at issue. Um, and of course we see different governments taking steps toward implementing the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, which has FPIC in there as a standard. What FPIC means, how that relates to the duty to consult is something that is going to be a, a very hot button issue for, for the foreseeable future, I think. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't wanna carry on too long and we can, um, yeah, take, take other things up in uh, Q&A. Perfect, thanks Professor Hamilton, that was excellent. Um, <clears throat> now we haven't actually heard from everybody quite yet here, so I'll just move through the sort of, I guess we're, we'll, we'll shift the idea of the introductions here, but I'll just, uh, I'll turn to, um, I'll turn to Ms. Conroy next and uh, just, uh, before we, I have a list of other questions we can dive into here, but if you want to um, just give us sort of a brief overview of what your work involves and and, uh, and how you're situated with um, with consultation. Sure. sure, no problem. Good good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, as our friends stated before, I'm a partner in the Edmonton office of MLC Indians, and um, I've been in the area of Aboriginal law or Indigenous law for about 15 years. Um, um, so I started working in this area at a very exciting time when the first mega suitcase was uh, released in 2005 from the Supreme Court, as well as Haida and Taku. And, and they were sort of the, the Supreme Court's legal foundation and guidance with respect to the Crown's duty to consult um, the court. Um, confirmed in those cases that it was a duty and if it wasn't met, um, uh, decisions made by the Crown could be overturned by the courts. And um, it was important in a, in a few ways, um, uh, as we all know, in terms of um, regulatory matters uh, involving project approval. So most of my work, but not all of it, but most of it involves representation of Métis communities or First Nations 
in regulatory matters. So um, where there's a project that um, needs approval under the environmental assessment uh, system um, that's applicable, um, I uh, represent the First Nation and Métis community involvement in that. Um, so uh, you'll see that with the Alberta Energy Regulator, for example, on you know, they regulate most oil and gas projects in Alberta. Uh, uh, Mr. Perkins shop at the um, Alberta Utilities Commission, some of uh, the facilities or transmission lines that his commission approves um, will uh, impact Indigenous interests. Um, the National Energy Board, now the Canadian Energy Regulator, and also um, quite involved these days with the uh, new federal impact assessment agency and, and their review of projects. So, um, just very briefly, I won't go through all the case law because Professor Hamilton did a very uh, good 3,000-point <laughs> review of the law, but it is, has been interesting to see the evolution over the last 15 years with these tribunals um, um, and how they have evolved to try to, um, or sometimes resisted trying, <laughs> to build in um, um, the legal requirement uh, with regard to the honor of the crown, including consultation and, um, if necessary, accommodation. Um, uh, and, and it's been interesting to watch. Sometimes it feels like it goes very slow from my perspective in terms of that evolution, but uh, I guess that is the nature of uh, Aboriginal rights law. Um, um, and I think I just wanted to address one thing Professor Hamilton said, um, if I may. Um, uh, if, I, if I understood correct, I, correctly, I think Professor Hamilton said at the high end of the duties himself, um, you know, there's a requirement for two way dialogue, as we saw in the slave abuse decision. Um, I would just push against it a little bit and say that there has been a comment from the Supreme Court that consent may be required in certain circumstances. Um, uh, where the duty to consult is triggered. Now, we haven't seen a case where a court has said, you know, on these facts, consent is required, but I, I would say, I would put to you that, that that's still open, that consent may be required in certain circumstances where the impact is uh, severe enough and where there is, say, a proven right um, under Section 35. And I would contrast that with a veto um, uh, uh, power. Um, and um, yeah, that's all, that's all my comments for now. And Professor Hamilton can, and I can have more discussion on it with the rest of the uh, folks watching. Perfect. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, okay, we'll turn to uh, Mr. Snow. Uh, we'll just, uh, looking at the time, and I'll just sort of maybe give you a question as well as your introduction comments here if you want to. Um, if you want to let us know sort of what your what your position involves and, and um, your views on this, as well as uh, if you see that there's anything um, problematic with current guidance from, from the courts. Ambo was pitch, the Goon Jawa Minta Winchus Dabi Ishnish. It's good to be here. Thank you to the Running Meat Society and uh, University of Calgary for, for hosting the session today. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I myself am a graduate of the um, University of Lethbridge in the Business Administration program uh, many, many moons ago in the 1990s. And I've also done work with the um, in environment and oil and gas along the way uh, into the 2000s and then eventually made my way back to the reserve here at, uh, at uh, Stony Nation and uh, been working there since... Uh, Initially in 2010 with the uh, Wesley Consultation uh, Office, and then I moved into the Consultation Manager as of uh, 2012. So uh, I've seen a few governments come and go and what they've tried to do uh, in and around consultation policy uh, in that time. And I've been to many meetings with uh, uh, Indigenous Relations and with uh, very, very many proponents, uh, just like Gary with the AUC, and have also been uh, making time in the last few years to do more of, uh, to do more cultural presentations. Uh, for example, like with the Chiniki Lecture, Chiniki Lecture series with the, uh, 
the uh, History Graduate Students Union there at the U of C, uh, just trying to get uh, a bit more uh, Indigenous um, uh, content uh, in, or directly from First Nations uh, out to the, the student groups. So happy to be here today. Uh, it's a good and uh, uh, timely uh, topic. Uh, my first comment that I wanted to make was that um, consultation, I guess there's a legal, there's a legal definition to it, but there's also uh, a meaning that consultation has uh, for Indigenous people. And it's important because when we talk about consultation, we're really talking about the effects that projects have on the land. And that's important because Indigenous people have a relationship to the land. And if a project comes along, it's going to impact that relationship. What's also important is that a project may impact the environment. And that environment affects our relationship to the land, the vegetation, the wildlife. And then also, in a sense, when you have a project coming onto a landscape that impacts land, it also impacts ourselves, the identity that we have. Because if my family, my ancestors, my forefathers, if they all went out and gathered and did certain cultural activities on a landscape, and now I can no longer do those activities, that affects who I am as a person, as an Indigenous person. Uh, there's a lot of good information that was said here this morning. Uh, the, uh, and and I, was, I was taking it all in, but uh, those are the few of the things that I wanted to raise uh, here in my comments. So the, the importance of consultation is that right now, I guess, the, the current state that we're in I think we have to look at it uh, not just from the chronological order, but understand it on how it has unfolded. And what I mean by that is that Alberta did not have a consultation policy until 2005. So that didn't happen until Mikasu took him to court and won in 2005. And then the government was forced to create this policy, the policy that we still have today, uh, largely unchanged. Uh, there were some uh, rumblings of change back in 2012, 2013, when the, the Levy Act was being proposed, uh, but that didn't go very far uh, and there was no, not a whole, whole lot of uh, momentum behind it. It was, it was rejected uh, by, by many, uh, chiefs of many nations uh, here in Alberta, Treaty 6, 7, and 8. So I think the problem is, I guess my comments here to the, to the students and everyone is that while we have a, a consultation policy, consultation policy that was developed in a silo, it wasn't developed um, collaboratively with nations. And I think that's important to keep in mind because we're not working, we're not in a true relationship with government. And if we were in a true relationship with government and, and project proponents, then I think we would be a little bit further along in, in, the, in how consultation unfolds. And so uh, the only other point here I wanted to make was that uh, back in 2010, there was a document that was released by uh, Treaty 6, 7, and 8 uh, during the discussions at that time uh, where the leadership um, forwarded a document that proposed instead of going the policy route to go through consultation agreements between government and First Nations. And ever since that time where it, we haven't had uh, very great dialogue uh, since then. Um, I would note that uh, while we have consultation agreements in place for, uh, uh, for facilities, 
uh, for proposed projects. Uh, that pro consultation agreement, the funding does not encapsulate the whole policy discussion. So that whole policy discussion is not uh, a point that is, is actively being worked on. Well, not from the nation's level. Um, and I've, I have raised that point with uh, Indigenous relations for many years. Uh, the fallout that we see from consultation, not doing consultation properly, uh, are uh, at the extreme end are protests. Uh, people very unhappy, upset with uh, the way that uh, a project is uh, brought up and, and passed. And, and uh, in some cases, uh, if it's a level one, you you may not see any uh, you may not see any information on a given project uh, that still occurs today. Uh, so I think that um, uh, I just wanted to raise those comments around the relationship to land, around uh, the proposal that uh, uh, nations have made uh, back to government in 2010, and that to say that the current legislative, the current policy that we're dealing with is not something that is, was collabor was done in collaboration. It was done uh, very much outside and away from, from nations, uh, like an imposition. And so in my view, we're not at a true relationship. We're not having true dialogue in, in understanding uh, what consultation should be. So I'll, I'll leave it there.